Why are there not more fat dogs out there? Well, honestly, there's a metabolic reason. They have more brown fat. That's not to say that you're not going to find a fat dog. I'm sure you can find a fat dog, but largely we don't see as many fat dogs as we see fat humans. And again, it comes back to the fact that they have more brown fat. And this video is going to teach you how you can activate more of your brown fat, but also how it works because it's fascinating science with our body's built-in non-shivering thermogenesis that allows us to just incinerate calories without any work. It's kind of a miracle. Hey, if you like science and you like biochemistry, but you don't want to go to sophomore biology class, make sure you hit that red subscribe button. And also turn on the little bell button to turn on notifications so you never miss a daily beat on this channel. After this video, I highly recommend you check out Natural Heaven Pasta. When it comes down to any kind of low carb protocol, intermittent fasting protocol, these guys have nailed it. This is some of my favorite stuff to mix up with pesto, to mix up with marinara sauce, to have a delicious pasta treat that doesn't contribute to my waistline. So this stuff's made out of 100% hearts of palm. One ingredient, that simple. So anyway, definitely check them out. If you like pasta or you miss pasta, now you can have it. So special link down below, you can use that code and get a special price and they're a big supporter of this channel. So thank you, Natural Heaven. Now let's get into some interesting science about dogs and fat. We have to start off with a lesson from the dogs. And I know this is weird, but I find it fascinating. If you look at sled dogs, they have an insane amount of endurance, an insane amount of endurance, so much so that scientists get curious. So they took a look at sled dogs and they had them do 100 mile races or events for four or five days in a row. And they took muscle biopsies the size of a matchstick, which sounds like that would be just tremendously painful, every 100 miles to see what kind of energy substrates the muscles and the dogs were, were using. Well, they found the first 100 or 200 miles or so, they were largely using glycogen. They were burning through their carbohydrate stores in their muscle. But then after that, they suddenly switched gears to using huge amounts of fat. And we're not talking ketones like we do in the biochem world with the human body. They were taking fats directly out of the bloodstream and sucking it right into the muscle and using it as fuel. It's still a mystery as to how this was occurring. They noticed that their blood lipid levels were so high. They were eating so much fat, the fat was in the bloodstream and going straight from the bloodstream into the muscle to be fueling it. This is fascinating because we now see that these dogs have so much mitochondrial density, which is going to come back to play later in this video, so much mitochondria that they can handle just an exorbitant amount of fat flooding their body, their cells at one time, and their body just uses it. And they eat 12,000 calories a day of mainly fat during these races, and they just burn it. Okay, their bodies are so efficient at fat burning, they can go for hundreds of miles. Where does this make sense with what I'm talking about? Well, it translates into brown fat in humans because humans have this capability to utilize fat as just a, a heat source and to utilize fat a lot easier with their brown fat. You see, brown fat is existing on all of us. Some of us have more than others simply because of genetic predisposition and some you know, have very little. But brown fat is brown literally because there is so much iron and so much blood and so much mitochondria in it. It is like an energy epicenter. The mitochondria is the energy powerhouse of the cell anyway. So the more mitochondria, the more factories you have. Brown fat is brown because it has so much mitochondria. So why don't we have more of it? I wish we did. Well, let's talk about how this brown fat virtually burns fat for you. It comes down to non-shivering thermogenesis. Okay, this brown fat just almost operates in a dysfunctional way where it just creates heat. In a normal cell that's creating energy, it works like a car battery. Okay, the battery is providing energy to make the car go. So the mitochondria takes the energy from the food that we ate and it processes it into energy that we utilize to move our body and to do things, just like a car, right? In brown adipose tissue, there is something called an uncoupling protein. And this uncoupling protein comes in and it short circuits the battery. So the battery doesn't create energy, but it creates energy dissipated as heat. So it's like if you were to come in and you were to short circuit your car battery, it wouldn't propel or start your car, it would suddenly just create sparks and heat. Well, that's happening inside our body, incinerating calories, which is such an amazingly cool thing. Now, in white adipose tissue, regular, just unsightly body fat that we have in our bodies, what happens is when the sympathetic nervous system, adrenaline, noradrenaline, epinephrine, activates and it triggers that white fat, the white fat mobilizes fat into the bloodstream. 
that's the response. It hits what's called a beta adrenergic receptor. So this beta adrenergic receptor allows fat to get mobilized into the bloodstream. This is amazingly cool stuff, except it comes with one major problem. What good is mobilizing fat if you're not going to go out and burn it? You can have all the fat being mobilized in the bloodstream that you want, but if you're not acting upon it and doing something with it, it's just gonna cycle back around and go right back to storage. Now, on the contrary, we've got brown fat. When brown fat gets acted upon by the sympathetic nervous system, it does something different. It takes those calories, it takes that fat, and it just creates heat. I mean, tell me that isn't a better deal, right? Uh, yeah, turn on the fat, let it burn by itself where I can sit on the couch watching Netflix or let the fat come into the bloodstream and actually have to go do something with it. I mean, come on, I'm, I like to do things too, but it's not a bad idea to just burn fat while you're sitting on the couch, right? So how do we increase our levels of uncoupling protein? We can't always dictate how much brown fat we actually have. I mean, there are mechanisms to increase that and I've done videos on it, but it's long and it's a tangent. So how do we increase the actual butter knife, so to speak, that's short circuiting our battery? How do we add more of that? Well, turns out that there are a couple molecules we need to pay attention to. And this gets pretty biochemy, but I'm going to loop it back to just the simple fact. Mainly, it comes down to something called PGC1A. PGC1A is a molecule that's been heavily researched, and there's a lot of confusion surrounding it. Uh, it seems to activate uncoupling protein, but PGC1A can't possibly activate uncoupling protein because it doesn't have an ability to bind to a transcription factor, to bind to DNA. So it needs a bona fide transcription factor along with it. Well, a lot of the research has now found that that transcription factor that it needs is something called interferon regulating factor four, IRF4, or interferon regulator factor rather. This IRF4 binds to PGC1A, binds to the DNA, and triggers the release of uncoupling proteins. Turns out that animals that do not have IRF4 end up obese, they end up cold intolerant, makes sense because they can't do non-shivering thermogenesis, and they end up insulin resistant. So this IRF4 is pretty dang important. Well, what are some of the best ways to increase IRF4? Increase your ability to utilize fats. So fasting, massive improvements in IRF4 and PGC1A therefore resulting in more uncoupling proteins. Okay. Another way is going to be proper meal spacing. Having your timing between meals being very strategic. Having longer gaps and no snacking so you actually get the activation of glucagon, or the upregulation of glucagon, which has this circumnavigating effect on that. Another thing is a utilization of things like oleic acid. Okay, so oleic acid is going to be in avocado oil. It's going to be in olive oil. The oleic acid has something known as oleoethanolamine, which has a direct effect on PGC1A as well. So we combine that with PGC1A. Oh, anyway, long story short is fasting, monounsaturated fats and proper meal spacing has a big effect on this. You could have probably fast forwarded to the end of this video just to see this, but come on, we needed to hear the dog science too. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.